When it comes to working with visual effects, director and lifelong Boy Scout Peter Paul Basler has learned the hard way to always be prepared on this episode of VFX for Indies. Welcome to this episode of VFX for Indies, the podcast about the intersection of visual effects and independent filmmaking. I'm your host, Paul DeNigris, visual effects artist, filmmaker, and CEO of boutique VFX shop, Foxtrot X-Ray. With me today is a director, filmmaker, title designer, uh, all-around renaissance man who has uh, collaborated with me and my team over the years a number of times, and in fact directed the very first official Foxtrot X-Ray project. So he holds a special place in our heart here. Uh, I would like to welcome to the podcast, Peter Paul Basler. Hello, thanks for having me, Paul. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here. Why don't you fill the audience in a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you've done, what your career has kind of looked like. Sure, um, I like to consider myself an independent filmmaker. Um, I'm, if I put a title to it, I'm a writer, uh, director and producer. Uh, I think I've held every job in the industry, um, aside from lead actress, I guess. Um, uh, but I've even, I've even, because I've been an assistant director, I've even been pressed into, into putting on the, putting on a suit and hopping into a scene. So, um, I've done it for a while and I was thinking about coming on this uh, podcast, uh, with you today, Paul. Um, and the first project I ever did. VFX was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, it wasn't even something that was sort of um, within my reach. It was, you know, it wasn't a tangible thing that I thought that I could do. Um, that was 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, and has certainly working with folks like you and then working in different um, movies with different types of VFX and, and understanding what they can achieve has changed my perspective on how I operate on set uh, as a director, uh, and then when I wear my producer cap, and as a producer as well, uh, making a movie happen um, uh, quickly, uh, but looking but looking the best it can be. Right, and I could tell you know from our very first collaboration that you had a good sense of the VFX process and kind of what you needed to provide to VFX artists to be able to accomplish what you were asking. Right, so the first project that Peter and I collaborated on was a, a sports movie, and it required a lot of crowd replication. Right. They, they're in a in a in a closed arena and uh, there weren't a number there were there just wasn't enough people, enough extras on set to fill the stands. And so what I was provided with was the principal photography of the the actors doing their thing. And then the it with mostly empty stands, usually almost every shot, the stands were completely empty. But then Peter and his team shot, uh, you know, plates. Right. So they they fill a section of the stadium and shoot a plate and then move everybody to another section. So we, you know, we sort of had a straight on section. We had a corner curve section. We had another angled section. And so we had these different pieces and they'd move people around. Uh, and so we had all of these, uh, these plates to, to put it together. And it was, um, it was really refreshing because I've been in situations where people come to me and say, I need to put crowd here. And I say, well, what did you, what have you shot? And they say, nothing can't you just make people in the computer and i say sure it's good that's way outside your budget right but peter and his team they they gave us what we needed and so we were able to pull those shots off uh in a, a reasonable amount of time w with a with a very you know modest budget so uh you know peter talk about like going into that project sure what what we, obviously you were prepared so you know what got you to that point where um, you and I hadn't even had a conversation yet. We didn't even know each other when you filmed this, right? So it wasn't a, a case of you you talked to me. Maybe you talked to another VFX supervisor. I don't know. Kind of what went into the preparation that, that got us to that point? Well, I think um, I'll back up a little bit and say that that project uh, was all shot on location in Colorado. We did some pickup work in interior shots in some arenas here in Southern California, but that gives you a very different look than Colorado, obviously, in the winter. Um, and one of the things that we couldn't get on our schedule was how are we going to shoot this finale? And, um, if you've done your work on the setup to your third act, you really want it to look as good as possible. Um, and I had luckily done a few projects, um, 
and had and they were VFX heavy. Uh, so I had an, a, a bit of an understanding about what we would need as a filmmaker to provide to you and your team to make it look good. One of the things that was the most challenging, and I believe you you talked to me, Paul, and sort of baby stepped me through, uh, which sometimes director needs that, um, is we were shooting actors on the ice with a camera operator on the ice who was moving left to right, but also forwards and back. And sometimes left, right, forwards, back, all in the same sequence. So the parallax, the the way that you see the crowd and the audience was was uh, changing, which made it very difficult. Um, and to your question, yes, we did go to a few other houses um, and uh, they were either flummoxed on how they would actually do it or or they were just, there's just no way for a low budget movie. Um, and to your credit, um, your team, you know, took it on and said, I, I, we know how to do this. And um, I think the end results on that is is something that um, you don't think about it. It doesn't, it's not a VFX that is showy, like an explosion or a monster where your brain goes, we know that this is pretend that didn't happen. They didn't blow up Tom Cruise or, or whoever's in your movie. Um, and, and you, you, as an audience engage it in a certain way, this is, and it's really funny because a lot of the work and you, you, I'm sure you can attest to this and other filmmakers have talked about it is doing stuff that if you do your job, right, no one knows you even did anything. And it's hours and hours and hours of work. And this is definitely one of those. The crowd um, is responding to the nationals of an ice hockey or a figure skating competition, and they needed to look as natural and real as possible, and not be showy and not call attention to themselves, and fill what was a ten thousand seat arena. Um, and we had like three hundred actual uh, <laughs> background. And you know, I um, I used as many tricks as I could to reuse those 300 extras again and again and again and move them around and pick shots where I wasn't um, showcasing the crowd. But one of the things that I did also in my homework is I watched some of the movies that have been done before with uh, either ice hockey or figure skating. And what one of the ones that is the most popular is a movie called The Cutting Edge. Early 90s, mm -hmm. it, is the, it is the breakthrough figure skating movie at the time. And what they ended up doing was the the sequence which was the finale of watching these two uh uh skaters uh compete was it was a single spotlight in a darkened arena that followed them around and you go wow that's dramatic that's over the top why are they doing that from a practical sense this is early 90s they're either going to fill it the arena with extras and they're going to pay to feed them and clothe them and all this stuff or they chose that so you don't see them. And I, I didn't want to go that route. Um, I wanted it to, to feel like there was a crowd. And so I think anytime as an independent filmmaker, you start to do a project, there's a little bit of a leap of faith. And I said, I'm going to do it my best to get good, clean images. I'm going to do these plates and give the material and then hope I find the right, the right VFX team. And luckily we did. Well, thanks. Uh, it was a, definitely a learning curve for us. It was one of those uh, classic scenarios where somebody says, can you do this? And you say yes. And then you scramble with your team to figure out how to do it. Um, you know, and some of the shots were super straightforward and some of them where the camera is moving in, you know, six degrees of freedom, panning, tilting, you know, moving on X, Y, and Z all at the same time because you had a, you had a great skater uh, as your camera op. Uh, yeah, some of those were, were a challenge and, it, and required, you know, breaking those plates up into multiple little little layers, you know, one one row of seats at a time and putting them on 3D cards and all of that sort of stuff. Let me tell you, though, great training for the post-COVID era. We do right. that a lot now. We do a really? lot of crowd replication now because of because of COVID, because, uh, you know, because there aren't big crowds anymore. Sure. Even, uh, you know, we did a Christmas movie last year where it was like, you know, a 400 seat little community theater and they brought in 20 extras and we replicated them 20 times, right? Because of COVID, because they, they don't want to deal with the, uh, the, the health implications or the cost of screening everybody and all of that. And so they, you know, they had a bunch of people that were, friends and family of the crew and cast that were in the bubble and they brought them in and we just replicated them all around and changed red sweaters to green and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's it's all like we we're really good at that now because we we kind of went to film school on that on on your movie uh, to figure out how to do that. So um, so I'm happy, if I have help, I'm happy to help. Paul. It, yeah, if I haven't thanked you before, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, <laughs> and thank you for the faith uh, that we could pull it off. So, like I said, Peter and I have then uh, collaborated on a number of projects, and and Peter's a close collaborator with uh, my VFX producer Jay Sathian, who I met on this film and who has continued to work with me since then. So, again, that movie, um, you know, just kind of like set the tone for. Uh, my company and the team. And, um, and so it's a, a situation where, you know, now when Peter has VFX, he's bringing Jay and I on when we have uh, projects like um, uh, there was a title sequence on a horror movie that we, we did uh, a couple of years ago where we needed uh, somebody with a vision to direct the opening title sequence and really shoot some interesting, creepy stuff. You know, you know Peter, uh, we brought Peter in. So it's, it's kind of like a, a nice little family unit that we've got here that, uh, that we continue to work together. So uh, one of the things that we did was a, a zombie horror movie called DJ Z uh, that Peter directed and was a fun combo of practical on set gore and some stuff that we did in post. Peter, why don't you talk about DJ Z and kind of how that project came about? Yeah, so right right as we were finishing up the, the sports film uh, about 2016, 17, uh, a good friend of mine who had shot a creature feature, a mega creature feature that I had done, which was very VFX heavy, um, he had gone on to be the DP of note on a TV show called Z Nation, uh, which was a sci-fi channel, sort of low-budget version of The Walking Dead. I was able to, in 2017, fly out to Spokane, Washington, and I shadowed on two episodes uh, of the show, um, not episodes that my friend was directing, uh, which was uh, which was weird, but he and I had such a good rapport that he pitched me to some other directors on the show because I was friends with him. They said, yeah, sure, come on and, 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 and um, check, check me out. I don't know you, but Alex vouches for you. Uh, you're a good guy. So I came off of that uh, shadowing, and I had I had dipped my toe into the mythology of Z Nation. It was in its fourth season, so there were a lot of episodes. And what I wanted to do was my own version of Z Nation, my interpretation of Z Nation, um, and and show off my directing skills because I wanted to be in the mix on the next season um, if I could uh, to direct. Uh, directing television is something that uh, I've I've aspired to do for a long time. Um, and with my indie background, I felt like, so we, we shot that movie up in the Mojave desert. Um, we used my garage as the bunker for the mysterious, uh, DJ who is broadcasting during the zombie apocalypse. And we really wanted to go practical. Um, frankly, I, we created a mold of one of my lead actors heads. Um, uh, we matched his hair, uh, perfectly the switch from the real actor to the, the dummy. You cannot tell. Um, and we filled the the, um, the the rubber head with all sorts of goo and grossness and, and bits of brain, as you do. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure just a typical Tuesday for any filmmaker. <laughs> and on the day, of course, because we're working with practical effects and liquid and so on, we tried it and it looked very unimpressive. Instead of a large squirt and something that would make you react vis vis uh, emotionally, viscerally, gutturally and go gross. You just went, that's it. Um, and, uh, I was a little bit defeated. Um, we had already started a collaboration on the sports film and, and I brought that, uh, to you, um, uh, and uh, through Jay and, um, got really what I was looking for. Um, the, one of the things I had to overcome as a filmmaker was having done some VFX stuff in the early 2010s, in my mind, VFX hadn't got to the point where the where liquids look like liquids. Um, I'm also a big James Bond fan. Uh, Die Another Day has a terrible, terrible <laughs> CG sequence. It's one of the worst uh, in Bond history. Because they did that sequence, they rebooted with Casino Royale, which is a great, great, great film. So I'm thankful that it exists, but I can't ever watch it because it's just terrible. And so I had this negativeness about it. Um, and Jay said, let me bring it, let me bring it to Paul. Let's see what we can do on this. And one of the things that you did, Paul, and, and your team, which I really loved is 
we had this little shot after the, so you made the blood and we were now we're now we're getting into as a director where I have the um, ability, you know, you showed me it. I went, no, I need a bigger spurt. And then, you know, you're giving me the options. You're giving me those tools so that I can react creatively, which is always the dream of a director. Mm -hmm. Give me options. Let me make choices. That's your job as a director. Right. Um, right after. So this head gets squashed, the brains and guts fly out of this zombie head. We cut back to it, um, and you had the the actual head brain matter like sliding, which was just that little like cherry on top of like if you watch it, and I've seen it with a crowd where people go like this, they turn away, then they look back, and we get them again. So we go right to that, and they get that little bit of. So um, I always love that, and it and it changes it changed my confidence in what could be done with VFX as an indie filmmaker. Great. Yeah, that was a lot of fun because, um, you know, blood is a tricky thing. I, I always say that, uh, you know, the heart, uh, among the hardest things that we ever do is uh, are shots that have blood because everybody has an opinion on what looks right. Yeah. We all think we know what blood looks like, yeah. <laughs> right? And how it behaves and how it sprays and how it moves, most of which is informed by horror movies, uh, some of it informed by reality. Uh, and the, the truth is, no two instances of blood ever look alike in the real world, in the movies, you know, no matter what, right. Depends on a whole bunch of things like where it comes from, if it's oxygenated, you know, how, how is it under pressure? Is the person dead already? Not that, you know, there's all sorts of things they have to take into effect and uh, into account. And everybody uh, is like, it's not red enough. It's too red. It's not, it's not shiny enough. It's too shiny. It's too transparent. It's too this, it's too that. Uh, and so we end up going, Lots and lots of revisions on most blood shots, but specifically because of that. Um, but what was fun here was you had that practical reference. You you did have practical blood, some that came out. Yeah. So we had viscosity, we had color, we had gloss. You know, we knew we. So all we were doing was matching. In other words, we weren't creating it from our imaginations or from what we thought it should look like, and you weren't responding to it from what you thought it should look like. It was always. Does it match what we got on camera? Does right. it look like it's in the frame with the other practical blood that didn't work as well, but is still there in a setting right. its own? So that was great because that that's kind of the ideal scenario. You know, um, anytime a filmmaker comes to me with a shot where it's, we didn't do anything and I need you to add blood. That's when we're like, okay, we're off in, we're off in fantasy land and it's going to be, it's going to be 10 revisions before we get this shot dialed in. But a filmmaker comes in and says, I have some practical blood in here. I want more of that. That's, you know, we're not, we're knocking that out in, you know, three or four revisions and everybody's happy. Yeah. Um, and it, and that was great. And then, yeah, then to add those little, those little extra textural elements, like the, the, the head, you know, the, the, the practical head sort of collapsed a little bit kind of as it sort of, you know, ran out of stuff inside it after the stomp. And so adding that extra little, you know, squish of brain matter inside it and then uh and then to to me my favorite shot of the sequence is the guy who stomped looks at the bottom of his shoe and we put a piece of bloody scalp on there and had it slide off <laughs> yeah it drops it drops off right before you cut away which is awesome yeah. yeah so that was that was a lot of fun and again it's you know your your practical effects people were setting the tone and then we were we were just playing in the the sandbox that they had they had set up for us right um as opposed to coming up with something from whole cloth, which is always a challenge. So you referenced this earlier movie uh, that you worked on that was very VFX heavy. Um, and you've, you've mentioned it to me before that you learned a lot of lessons yeah. on that. And that's Big Bad Bugs, correct? Yeah, um, it, was, it was released as the Vortex. Um, this is before streaming uh, was as popular as it is, but it still was uh, a V word at the end of any list that you had alphabetized. Um, and we had done this movie before Big Ass Spider, before Sharknado, and before the sort of tongue-in-cheek, low-budge action thing was uh, as celebrated as much as it was. So it was originally called Big Bad Bugs, and like any um, great, uh, good, uh, uh, low-budget, we leaned into the comedy because I had, I, you know, I would like every five pages I can do something VFX wise, but I just don't have the budget for every two pages, right? You know, that kind of math was going into it. Um, and 
the um, the the distributor at the time said, no, no, the Vortex, that's what it's got to be. We said, hey, you're the you're the expert. Um, and uh, we had a five year deal. So after five years, we got it back and we've released it as Big Bad Bugs. <clears throat> um, it was a mega creature film. So um, these crystals are coming through a wormhole when they hit these little creatures. Um, they become mega creatures. So we have a mega scorpion, we have a mega hornet, um, mega snakes at the end, you know, as you do, as, 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 as you see in these type of films. Um, I was shooting the end of the movie on a location that was a rental uh, in uh, Santa Clarita. The Blue Cloud Movie Ranch has a full Iraqi village set that they built for the opening of the original Iron Man. So that, that whole... Iraq sequence, it's still standing, and it's been redressed to all sorts of Middle Eastern. It's not inexpensive for what it is because it's it's a massive facility. And um, as you do on low-budget films, and, and I'd, I'd like to talk about this a little bit more too, is you do a, sort of a, a back-end page count. You say, well, this is the money I've got. You know, every day that I add, I got to feed all these folks and pay these folks and pay for blah, blah, blah. So the easy math was we're going to shoot 10 to 12 pages a day, which is very ambitious, mm -hmm. which means you're doing very few takes, you're doing limited coverage, um, and you just got to rock and roll because you just got to get it done. And so we had this location for a day and a half. That's as much as we could. And I really felt as a filmmaker that I was just, I hope there's a VFX team that can, because at the end it was going to be snakes fighting. There were these crystals that were flying out. We had our, lead actors ducking crystals that weren't there. There was so much in my head of what this end visual was going to be. Um, and it's pretty good. You know, um, again, it's dated. It's 2011. Um, luckily, again, my tone was comedic. So we could lean into some of the flaws as if we meant to do that, if that makes <laughs> sense. Um, and it was a crash course. It was, it was my learning curve on what, how much you could get away with with the effects and how um, costly they were going to be and what the expectation from the industry was on how they were going to look. Um, and um, I think that helped me to be more confident when I'm doing an end sequence, like I was doing in Nebraska for the, for the uh, um, figure skating competition, because I already kind of been through the fire before I knew what I needed. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, and that's, Something that I try to cover with a lot of my guests is um, is that learning curve. You know, it's yeah. <clears throat> the the point of this podcast is really for filmmakers like you were in 2011 who are new to this, right? They're they're new to using VFX as a tool uh, because most of us, um, you know, we come through film school and we learn how to use sound as a tool and lighting as a tool and the camera as a tool to tell our stories. And VFX is something that's that wasn't really attainable, you know, when, when, when we were coming up, it wasn't something that, that independent filmmakers or student filmmakers could even touch. So there was no way to learn about it. Yeah. And it's only been in the last, you know, 20 years, 20 plus years that desktop VFX software, like after effects, uh, made it possible, um, for us to even consider visual effects as a, as a tool for, um, for independent filmmaking. And, um, and, you know, your comparison to television, you, you talk about, you know, uh, Z nation and wanting to direct TV to, in my mind, TV and independent film are very similar in terms of short schedules, not as much money as a big, a big budget feature. Yep. You have to do more with less, uh, and your, um, you know, a lot of times you're compromising the vision in order to, you know, get it, get it on air in seven days. Right. Um, so it's very, very, very similar. Um, so how, how has that experience, you know, with, with big bad bugs or the vortex, um, how has that experience kind of, if you could put a fine point on it, right. How you are used, how now you use VFX to help you tell your stories, you sure. know, how, how knowing that you've got that arrow in your quiver, yeah. How are you using it when you're when you're facing that blank page writing a, a new story? So there's there's two ways I think if we're talking about facing the blank page, understanding where VFX is at and what you can do on a budget and what you can accomplish does inform me when I'm writing, because originally it would be the edict was just write it and then you figure it out later. And so 
there's a studio version of your 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 space thriller, and then there's a low budge version of the space thriller. Doesn't change a word, but the VFX and the time you're on set does change quite a lot. Um, I have I I I was you as you were chatting just now, Paul. I had a thought. You know, I've been doing it for a while, and I was I was joking as we started that you know started in the, in the early two thousands, but. When I started, I, my first film was a, was a feature on film. And coming out of the film school, um, it was what you captured in the frame is what you got. Um, that's the way your mindset was. So you would be, as a director, you would be scanning the background and like, oh, I don't want that license plate in the shot. It's not of the, you know, the state we're supposed to be in or whatever. You, you. The image that you captured was what you lived with forever, and that was the thing, and so that really informed how you'd made your choices, right? Um, I noticed as we got into the 2010s that there was a shift also with my crew. So, for example, when we were doing Big Bag Bugs, we shot at the uh, Griffith Caves, which are the famous Batman caves uh, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And one day, a hiker was stuck at the top of the, like way up in the mountains, and so the LAPD sent a helicopter to get the hiker off the ledge, which is very, very noisy if you're trying to shoot an independent film. But again, we only had that for two days because it was a low budget movie and I had to keep shooting. So I said to the sound guy, get me the best scratch track you could. Everybody kind of understood that. They understood what was going to happen. We can do ADR later. We'll pick that up and we move forward. However, you know, when I was doing a film in the mid 2010s, 2015 or so, there was a time when the mic kind of dipped into the frame, right? I mean, here's my mic dipping in the frame. And one of my sound or one of the crew people yelled, boom, and killed the take that I loved. So I turned and I said, look, guys, I have eyes. I know that the boom is in the shot. Let's not if I like the take, I can, we can cut that out or we can paint that out. Mm -hmm. um, there was some understanding and obviously a younger generation is easier on the, you know, quicker on, on the computer, but it wasn't as commonplace as now. I think there, if I had that same conversation on a feature, they would e easily get it, uh, 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 if that makes sense. So um, there, there were, because of that too, you know, you, uh, you're always making choices. That's your, that's your job as a director. And you go, all right, I've got a beautiful two shot. I really want to punch in Paul's face for this next sequence. I got to see the emotion. Um, and there are times when I will, as a director, go back and say, wait a minute. We were shooting this 4K, 5K, whatever K we're at these days. And I've got a great performance here. I can, in post, I can take my two shot and make it a single, jump back. And it feels like to the audience that I did a new setup. I swapped the lens. Mm -hmm. I swung the lights a different place, and I haven't done it. I've I've taken that to post. Now that's not traditional VFX in a way, but it is. You're altering the frame in some way that's different than it was presented. Right. So so that is one of the tools that that I always keep in the back of my mind about how much can we play with this frame? What are what are what do I need to get? Because it's always a matter, especially on the low budget world, which is where I live, a matter of math. I've got this many pages. And sometimes, you know, you even do the math where you say, um, I need to get this information out. It wasn't the best performance. You know, it, it, it wouldn't give me my top 10 of the day, but it gets the information. It gets me from A to B. This is a transitional scene, et cetera, et cetera. I can live with that. Right. Um, so I say all that to say that it gives you a confidence, right? It gives you... Uh, it gives you a feeling like you can get things done. It changes the way you approach. And then the more that you see what a VFX team can deliver for you and the closer they get to an image that you've lived with in your head and when you were writing it, when you're on set and you're shooting it, again, it, it informs you. One of the things I used to always say about the post process is, man, you write it, you shoot it, and then you know where you learn how to do it? In editing, because when you're editing, you're going, who shot this crap? Oh, wait, that was me. Who wrote this darn scene that's too long and needs too many extras? That was me. And it informs your process when you start over, right? right. Um, nothing stands by itself. It's all part of this process. Um, and it is incredible how uh, VFX has changed so much. When we did Big Bad Bugs, we actually went to a company in L.A. that had... Um, 
done Robert Zemeckis' la latest film. I forget what it was at the time. And whatever choices we made, they would say, guys, we are so fast. Give us two and a half hours and we'll render this and you get to see what it looks like. And we're like, whoa, in two and a half hours, we can see what this is going to look like? That's so great. <laughs> uh, and we would wait, you know, and then they would turn it and you're like, no, I need to change this. All right. Well, in two and a half hours, we'll show you the change, you know. Um, and how much, again, this is 2011, 12, how much, you know, that has changed where now you can see it almost in real time and the options presented to you um, on, on a level that's equal or better to what we were doing in the early 2010s. Yeah. Um, yeah. You and I have had a chance to collaborate on a, <clears throat> on a film where we use Unreal Engine, which is real time. It's yeah. um, you, when, when we do get this opportunity, you're going to love it. We did a, a Western recently where we had to create a, a cave interior for the filmmaker uh, and we were able to just over Zoom, basically a conversation like this, just share a screen of Unreal Engine. And he was able to say, let's move the camera here. Let's put it. Let's put a little more light there as if he was on set working with his cinematographer. So, yeah, it's a completely new world. That's uh, for sure. Yeah. So you, you were talking about, you know, the punch in to create a, a, a separate close up. Another thing that we've been doing a lot of recently is the split screen comp where you have two actors whose rhythm is slightly different and mm -hmm. your take one, you know, actor a is giving you gold and take one, take two, take three. And then they start to, their energy starts to wane and yeah. actor B doesn't warm up until take, you know, five, six, seven. And now you've got, so you've got two different performances and then the filmmakers would just go, give me actor a from take one on the left side of the frame and give me actor B from take seven on the right side of the frame, stitch them together preserving the camera movement and all of that sort of stuff. And it, and it, it adds that extra dimension to your editing. It's not just, uh, you know, individual shots that you're able to use to craft a performance. Uh, it's, it's within the frame, you can craft the performances and, and create yeah. uh, a better, a better ensemble. Yeah, I, I did that. I did that um, in my very first film, the one we shot on film. Um, we, uh, had recorded the we had the audio of the first guy's part of being on the phone and we were able to play that on set so the second guy knew the timing but it was because of the when we did it and because we we're shooting on film there was no choice it was either this lines up this one doesn't line up we can't use it you know if you choose a then it forces you on your choice of b and i it is funny for me as a filmmaker because there is a moment toward the end where they fall out and the guy, our lead says something and then the, his sidekick is supposed to respond. And there's like a three second pause, which feels like an eternity where he finally goes, Oh, okay. Luckily it's, it's something where he's getting his nerve. So it almost creatively works. Um, but yeah, but back in the day you were, you were locked in. And again, the more you can provide a director, the opportunity to make choices, the closer you can get to their vision because uh, without choices, then you're just forced into, you're forced into stuff that just, you know, it works. As I said, sometimes you, you, you go, well, this isn't the perfect sequence, but you know, I need this information for exposition. I will, I'll leave it. Um, we'll cut it down or figure it out in post that type of thing. But yeah, yeah. It's it, what, what VFX now has done because it is uh, a, available and affordable to the indie filmmaker is allowed you more opportunities to make creative choices, which can only mean a better end product for, for the viewer. And, and that's what you're, that's what you're all chasing. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to speak to a, another point that you made where you, you said when you were shooting on film, you were really inspecting the frame and going, Oh, that license plate is out of place. We need to, we need to get that out of frame. I really wish that would come back. <laughs> I really do. I mean, as much as I um, appreciate being paid to paint out boom poles and paint out license plates and paint out crew reflections, I really would much rather see filmmakers spend their VFX budget on fun stuff, fun, creative stuff that yeah. actually helps them tell their story. We get a lot of work where it's, you know, the, the, if, they, if the filmmakers had just moved the camera three inches to the left and panned, it would eliminate the reflection of the crew. The, the shot would be more or less the same. It would yeah. serve the same purpose in the story, but they're not burning hundreds or sometimes thousands of dollars for us to paint 
them and their camera out of the, you know, the reflection of the bus window or whatever. Sure. Um, you know, in some ways, the ubiquity and the ease of visual effects has created some laziness in in that regard, right? The, the yeah. uh, ah, we'll just, yeah, we'll just paint it out. We, we, we're moving too fast. We have so many, so many pages to shoot today. Don't worry about it. We'll deal with it in post. Yeah. And then they're, and then they're trying to, you know, scramble to, to, you know, pull coins out of the couch cushions to pay us to do it yeah. instead of paying us to do something fun and that really, you know, helps them tell their story. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, to your point, I mean, I think, and I've been there, I, I was the first AD for a good long period in, uh, and I felt I was getting older and the directors kept staying in their early twenties. And it was, uh, and you were seeing that a lot. That was, that was the, you know, sort of uh, everything's rolling. And then they have one more comment, they step in frame and they're like talking to their actor, you know, the kind of stuff that we were taught when that camera's rolling, think of it as dollar bills rolling through the camera. So, um, you know, once you, that's the sacred, that, that is the sacred time. And once you, once you hit record, it's gotta be what you want. Um, so, so, so somewhere in between is, is, is probably what's, you know, the ideal for that, because again, you know, for me, when I need to make my 10 and a half pages, uh, it's a blessing that I can do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can, I can fix, I can fix it in post. Um, um, but yeah, to your point, it also makes for, uh, sloppier, uh, filmmaking in that, well, we'll figure it, we'll fix it, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. Until you know your list of fixits are more than the list of stuff that you that you got right. Um, so uh, I, I feel you on that. I try to I try to keep a happy medium. I, I hope, um, but you know, again, the world I live in is a lot of times it's move, uh, it, you know, get it, get, make it make it happen. So, um, and I and I think that's the that's the um, the give and take that every filmmaker has to has to think about uh, when they're when they're on set. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we just did a Christmas movie. We do a lot of Christmas movies. Um, and we just did a Christmas movie where the filmmakers had to decide between a bunch of stock footage of the city that they wanted to add Christmas decorations to, to help set the tone for the film. They decide between spending money on that or spending money on the crew reflections and boom reflections and things like that. And they ended up having to because the network is not going to air the movie with crew reflected Ooh. prominently in the, in, you know, windows and stuff. They had to prioritize the QC fixes, right? The things that, that QC is going to flag instead right. of spending the money on the story stuff that they really wanted to. Right. And it's, it's a shame because again, things, money's finite, right? Money's always finite on, on, on every production. It doesn't matter how big it is. Um, and it's, there's almost no excuse for it. Right with with how good our monitoring technology is, yeah. Right, there's no reason to to not have a, a big monitor at Video Village. There's no reason for a, a director to not have a a handheld display in his hand, his or her hand, all the time. Yeah. You know where you can just all right. Let's just let's just pause for five seconds. Just move the camera. Okay, now we can roll. I yep. just eliminated a VFX shot. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Please eliminate all those VFX shots. Let's do fun <laughs> no, stuff. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I, I was thinking of too, I did a film that I AD'd where it was a famous uh, DP and um, uh, she had, you know, she's been working for a long time, uh, obviously started in, in film and we were doing an insert shot, you know, and she, she lit that insert shot like uh you know, it's just going for Oscar gold and you're like, oh, man, it's just an insert, you know, there's, there's always that fine line. And again, I felt like for me, um, I was the young guy in that situation and I was doing the math in my head saying, um, we can, we can stabilize this in post. It's literally a static insert shot. We can give it a look, you know what I mean? Get a clean shot, move on. Let's not make it perfect on set because the amount of work that we can do in post is not a lot. It's just, you know, tweaking the color, color correct. It'll match it. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, um, and where we were spending all the time on, you know, blah, blah. So it's, <laughs> it's always about kind of knowing where you're at in the process. And I feel like, again, for me, having been doing it for a long time, the technology is changing rapidly and it changes quicker every time, which is one of the things I like about 
the fact that I do a lot of short films, people always ask me, what do you, what do you, why do you do short films? And what's, what's, because it, it allows me to flex a muscle in a creative way that's different than what I've done before. You know, if I get inspired by a zombie thing or a sports film or whatever. Um, and then I'm kind of staying up to date. I'm, I'm, I'm in the game. And like any other muscle that you, you know, it can atrophy. Um, and so keeping yourself engaged and keeping thinking about stuff and, um, and that way you're forced into new decisions and the technology, like, as I said, is changing. And so you're always sort of up trying to stay up to the moment, right? I mean, if you dropped out and you came back into the industry in five years, five years from now, think how, how much change is happening at this moment with, with AI and all these things, you would be a little bit lost, right? So, uh, it's something that keeps me fresh and, and, um, allows me to, like I said, flex the creative muscle, uh, but also stay kind of as current as I can be with, with technology. Right. So, yeah, we've, uh, we've collaborated on a couple of shorts recently, yeah. the, the, the pragmatist, which, uh, I guess you've got bigger plans for maybe turning into a TV series, at least yeah. the IMDB. <clears throat> we shot that. Yeah. We shot that, um, as a sort of a backdoor pilot and we wanted it to feel very much like, uh, like something you'd see on network TV, like an NCIS or a procedural. Um, and the, um, the writer on that has a whole, uh, Bible and, um, uh, episodes that he's written for the first season. Um, and we've been playing festival circuit with that and getting some noise and excited about that, that one. You want to talk about, um, you know, sort of the, some of the challenges or problems that we helped solve with, um, with VFX on drop of blood. Yeah, so um, that was definitely a case of uh, the budget informing how fast we moved. Um, um, I'll be real frank with you guys uh, and, and your viewers. Um, we shot very quickly, and there was footage even that was um, uh, out of focus. And you know, all, you're all you're faced with all these issues in post, and and I was kind of defeated on the project for a little bit. Um, and then we realized because it's a horror film and one of the things I wanted to do was scratch it up, scuff it up and, you know, mess with it and stuff. I could sort of lean into the, the flaws. We And we had shot um, everything. We had put a GoPro uh, mounted. Um, our lead actor is coming up to a sink. So the frame is sort of like this. And, he, and you're seeing his face as he's going through these emotions and he's going through this transformation. The drop of blood causes things to happen in a horrific, chaotic way. And uh, the, the practical kitchen had a window that sort of looked through the kitchen into the dining room. Um, and again, so back in the day, if we were going to that, we would live with that. And then we would dress through that. Right. And there would be a PA with a walkie sitting right there that like you can't walk through here or, you know, uh, you, you will die and all sorts of, you know, like it was it would be very serious on set. Um, and then someone would inevitably walk in and ruin a take or something would happen and through that window that has nothing to do with the story. Um, and, and we'd be sort of worrying about that all on, on set. Um, I actually set up this little GoPro as almost an afterthought thinking it might be cool uh, because we had footage issues and so on. We really went to that shot a lot um, and leaned on it. And, um, and there were several shots where you had uh, crew and other actors sticking their head into the window, looking at what's going on, you know, just having a great time, enjoying craft services, whatever. There was a whole other movie happening in that little window. Plus um, equipment, you, equipment on the oh, table yeah. in the back. Yeah. 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 There was all gear and goop and <laughs> the wardrobe was hanging. It was a mess. Um, and again, I said, you know, one of the things you guys do a lot of is uh, a ton of work to make it feel like you haven't done a thing. And that was definitely a case in point because that window then all became a, just a solid wall. Um, I believe there were maybe one or two handheld shots in there as well that you had to, mm -hmm. to you know, a little bit more difficult. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and me kind of in the back of my head doing that math as a director saying, yeah, we'll throw this shot up there. I know that it's going to be wide fish eyed, but I can punch. Maybe it's going to be something like that. Maybe I can use it, you know? Um, and, and like I said, because of the, um, uh, problems we had on set with the footage from that, we went to that a lot more than I intended. It was kind of a, a save my butt, if you will. Sure. Um, but it worked and, and, and you guys cleaned up all the, the window stuff and no one was the wiser. Right. I yeah. love stuff like that. I mean, you know, yeah. I do get filmmakers who are like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, we're making you put on all this work and no one's going to even know you were there. And I'm like, I kind of like that. I kind of like 
you know, if somebody saw a drop of blood and saw visual effects by Fox Run X-Ray, if they went to you, Peter, where, where were the VFX? I didn't see any. Right, right. That's when, like, yes, we did our job. <laughs> Love that. Uh, okay, so if you met a young filmmaker or not so young filmmaker who's new new to using VFX, and they said, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm about to make a feature or a short, and I know I'm going to need VFX, and I'm really nervous about it. Peter, you, you know, give me one piece of advice that that will help smooth this process for me, give, guide me so that I don't have to learn from all the mistakes that you learned from in, in the past. Sure. I guess I would coach them in saying, look, don't, don't, don't think of VFX as this big hurdle to overcome. Don't be worried about it being so costly that the only people that can do it are studios. Um, I would also have that that filmmaker find a VFX company that has something on their reel that they respond to and do a meeting and set that up from the beginning. I think it's much easier if it's a collaboration on a shot than, Paul, we've shot this, we messed this all up, can you fix it? Or this is what the vision is and you're like, I. I understand what your vision is. Let's be very clear. I can see this huge monster. You don't have a plate. You don't have, where am I putting the, you know, on this footage, it doesn't match your vision. Right. Right. Um, so I would, I would do that. Um, I would say also for them to look at projects that are out there as well. So if it's, if it's a sci-fi thing, if it's a horror thing, Look at stuff that's been done recent that your contemporaries have done in a similar budget range, and you can kind of get a sense of what can be done. You can you can use that as a rule of thumb, um, and it, it's pretty it's pretty incredible again how much VFX have changed and become accessible. So um, if it's a sci-fi movie. You, you're playing with tone and you're playing with stuff that we've created in our mind, but it's not real. I mean, space shuttles are real, uh, astronaut suits are real, but the rest of it, an alien is pretend, faraway planets are pretend. We have references from other big features, uh, Blade Runner, Star Wars, those type of things. So there is a sort of milieu that we're used to, but it's not, you can get fantastic. You can get it to look pretend because we want to believe we're in that mindset. If you're doing something that's a, a fight sequence and people strip down and, you know, muscles and so on, uh, fake blood might not work. It might take you out of the moment. Um, it could be something like Quentin Tarantino, like when the necks get sliced and it's like a spray of blood, but it's hyper-realistic mm-hmm. and you've gone into that hyper-realism. So um, you need to make choices and understand what the VFX are telling your audience. Um you can get away with a lot. You can get it to look very realistic on, with what you're doing with your time frame and your budget. Um, if you want it to be very realistic and it's not something that can be done with the effects, you know, then you might have to think about how do I do this practical? How do I remove wires? How do I remove the things that will make it feel real? Um, and Liquid has gotten to a point where it can feel, and as we were talking about, you know, with the goo coming out of the head explosion, I've done some blood stuff that looks very real where you've added blood um, into a sequence. Um, and again, on that type of a project, I if it looked pretend, if it looked stylized, I couldn't use it because the what I needed was it to feel visceral, to feel like the lead actor got the crap beat out of him. And that there was danger, and I needed you to, to believe it. And, and then luckily, um, um, we've gotten to a point where the VFX is so good, and you can you can uh, um, you know get something that's going to be believable. Right. So understanding the limitations, and also understanding what the audience will accept, yeah. and uh, kind of understanding that the audience is our partner, right? In, in a lot of ways, you can pull off a lot with sound. Right. You can pull off a lot with shadows right. that the audience can fill in the blanks with, um, uh, you know, sort of the barest sketch of an idea on the, in the frame and, and focusing your attention on what that sketch is and how it how it conveys that feeling uh, in the audience is um, it, that's that's good advice. I mean, it, 
so many times it is people think that VFX is this catch all, right? It's going to solve all my problems and I'm just going to shoot on green screen and we're going to, you know, we're going to build this set and post or whatever. And uh, in reality, it's like less is more. Uh, yeah. If you, you know, think back to the the movies of our, of our youth, right? Alien, like you don't see the alien hardly at all. Mm -hmm. Jaws, you don't see the shark hardly at all. Yep. Right. But they're no, they're no less threatening. Uh, in fact, they're more threatening than, you know, the last Sharknado movie where it's just shark after shark after shark after shark. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and some of that is because, again, visual effects is ubiquitous and quote unquote easy. Uh, and um, and they're focused more on the spectacle than on evoking the response in the audience. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's good advice. It's good advice for for sure. Um, you know, I always say uh, pe people when they criticize movies that are heavy on VFX, they're like, "Oh, there's too much CGI." And I and I, my response is, "You wouldn't say they shot this movie with too many lights, right? You, <laughs> right? It's not a matter of." too much cgi it's a matter of cgi that's not well executed right and and isn't helping tell the story and it's taking you out of the story right you right. wouldn't say they use too many cameras on this shot well maybe you maybe you would if it's over edited right <laughs> yeah you know cgi is a tool vfx is a tool nobody's gonna go there were too many grips on that movie that's why i didn't like <laughs> <All> it right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so what's next for you, Peter? What, what, what do you have in the hopper? I know you always have some cool stuff on the horizon. Um, I have a uh, time travel thriller that is very cool. Um, it's like a five to six million dollar budget. Stephen Baldwin, the youngest of the, the brothers, uh, is one of the producers on that project. Um, and he's very well known in the Christian market. Um, and one of my actor friends who's been in a lot of movies, uh, 12 different projects that I've worked on, uh, Michael Monks, uh, knows, uh, Steven quite well. So, um, that project is, um, uh, hopefully, uh, post strike, uh, one of the ones that we get to uh, play with pretty soon. Um, uh, according to, uh, uh, Steven's team, um, uh, it's a matter of when, not if. Uh, that's, that was our latest that we've heard from them. So we're super excited, super excited. Uh, I won't give the name of the title away. But, um, and that is a, a, a time travel sequence, and um, but it's a time travel thriller. Uh, so there's going to be some gun work. There's going to be, um, there's a sequence at the end where our hero is on a um, uh, an active uh, uh, test ground for a machine that can um, diffuse bombs and so on. So it's, he's in sort of a, a battle sequence. Um, how do we do that to look realistic, but be safe for our actor? Mm -hmm. um, there's also a uh, zapping sequence. So when the person travels through time, they're going through sort of a wormhole. And we've seen a lot of that with Star Trek and stuff. So there's that type of a thing. Um, so that one's coming up. Um, uh, again, you know, the strike being what it is, right? There's some things that, are, that have uh, slowed us down. I do have another project that I'm super excited about. A friend of mine is a multi-arm amputee and an actor. Um, and um, he is a, a, a bit of an older uh, cat than, than me. Um, and very funny, kind of lovable grouch in some ways in real life. And so it's going to be like a Seinfeld, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Sort of he's playing like a heightened version of himself. Um, and as somebody who now he he was disabled in his late twenties, he's in his sixties, so he's lived more of his life with a disability than he did with arms. Um, he's heard everything and had every kind of weird encounter, you know, just walking by and people are like, "Thank you for your service." He's never been in the military. Uh, people who are super religious want to pray with him out of randomly, you know, all this kind of stuff. And he's just trying to go to Home Depot and you know what I mean, like trying to go to the grocery store and get a gallon of milk, and all this stuff happens. Um, or the checkout girl who's giving him change and is so flustered because he's got hooks she doesn't know what to do and she shoves it all into his pocket and his pockets now <laughs> like you know like it's just it, it kind of writes itself from what his life has been and so yeah. we're doing that as um 30 minute episodes uh and we want to we possibly will raise the money ourselves and do six episodes put it up on youtube or kind of find an avenue for it um and using kind of what the pragmatist model we did so have the the end product look almost you know, like it could be on network today um so those are the things i'm Working on, uh, I do have another uh, horror slash thriller um, 
that we're rewriting and it's a, a young African-American kid growing up in suburban New England and uh, adopted. He's in this all white world. He's the only kid of color uh, with these fancy houses where the perfect lawns, but then behind everything is the facade and everything's all messed up and mm-hmm. he's living this terrible life. And uh, it's, it's very bleak, uh, but it, it's ending on a moment of hope. Uh, it's very much, uh, you know, a festival piece. Um, and we might we might get down and dirty and do that one super low budget. Even during the strike, we might we might be able to get the interim agreement to to start shooting. Um, so um, yeah, so you know, always always looking at that next thing, always juggling. Um, if you if you're an indie, that's what you got to do to keep the like I said, keep the muscle from atrophying and uh, and getting something out there. Yeah, for sure. Well, looking forward to our next opportunity to collaborate and also looking forward to just watching whatever you make next. It's cuz it's always it's always different. You every you you haven't made the same movie twice in uh, in our our time that we've worked together. Every every time I think I've kind of got the sense of what a Peter Basler movie is, you surprise me with the with the next one. So, uh well, thanks, man. I I try. I try not to be pigeonholed. That's that's yeah. one of the things and uh, like I said, I just love to I love to create and um, uh, maybe to my detriment, I don't know, maybe I should be the rom-com guy, but, uh, you know, I just love, I love it all. So uh, yeah. I like to play. So yeah. Keep flexing those muscles. That's, that's all you can do. Right. Yeah. So, uh, if, if people want to follow you on social media, where can they find you? So, um, I do have a website. I know that's old fashioned, but it's a uh, Peter Paul Bassler. My last name is uh, B as in boy, a S as in Sam L E R Peter Paul Bassler, one word.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm sort of on the Insta, but I don't really do it. I don't, uh, Twitter X, uh, <laughs> but, um, um, my, I'm with uh, Bohemia group management and uh, global talent as my agency. Um, hit me up on IMDb and IMDb pro, and you can see all my credits. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're down to, if you need some advice, uh, if you're in that, if you're in, if you're one of those filmmakers who's thinking about doing a project and you have creative questions about VFX and how it can help and, and enhance and, how do you do it? Um, I'd love to talk, as you can tell. My wife likes to say this. There's one thing I like to talk about is filmmaking. So uh, thank you, Paul, for bringing me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for being part of the show. And uh, listeners, t- take Peter up on that, right? That's a really gracious offer of uh, of his time and expertise. So, uh, so, so please take him up on that. And thank you to all my viewers and listeners for tuning in to this episode of VFX for Indies. If you're watching on YouTube, please uh, like, subscribe, leave us a comment. Let us know what you what you liked and uh, what you'd like to hear more of. And if you have questions for me or Peter or any of my guests, please leave a comment. If you're listening on any of the multitude of podcast aggregator services out there like iTunes, and Spotify, uh, a follow, a star rating and a review goes a long way to help it. Uh, help us reach more filmmakers. Uh, and uh, and if you know any filmmakers, the, the filmmaker in your life who needs to hear this stuff, please send them the episode. Thanks so much. And uh, for everyone at Foxtrot X-Ray, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Uh-huh.